might stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to see. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus faded all, all to him I go. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Brock Wright, and I am the high school pastor here at Main Street Church, and I'm going to pray to open the service. But before I do, I would love if you would grab some juice uh, and crackers just to join us in communion that Pastor Sean is about to lead us in later in the service. It doesn't have to be grape juice or anything fancy, just that you can join in with the church family as we celebrate communion. So Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you that you have interrupted the narrative of history to tell us this story of hope that you have not left us, that you have not abandoned us, that you are here for us and you have a good plan for all of us. So Jesus, we just dedicate this day to you in your name and all the church typed, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the joys of technology, right? But we're going to make this work, and uh, glad you're still with us. And uh, pray for it. Pray for the tech team. They're doing a great job working hard. And, uh, and so let's, uh, let's, let's uh, just celebrate the truth of the, uh, of, the, of the cross today and what Christ has done for us. I want to tell you a story. There was uh, 10 of them. Uh, 10 of them happened at different times, at different places, but they had the same outcome. And, uh, and some were young, and some were single, some had families, some had um, a wife and kids, and, uh, they, 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 but they hadn't been able to get close to their families for quite some time. In fact, these, these 10 guys I want to tell you about were the um, poster kids for social I- isolation, social distancing. And it all began with a rash on their skin. And in, in that day, no one understood um, the disease. You feared for your life if you got it. It, it, was, it was a disease that no one wanted to get. And this rash would, would show up and, and then it would kind of work its way through the skin to the nervous system. And what would happen is you'd begin to work or you'd be at your job or you'd be doing something and maybe you'd scrape your elbow on something and there would be a, a, a scrape or a cut and there'd be some blood or, or, or something and you wouldn't even notice it. And what would happen, those sores would then begin to get infected. And then people would come along and go, hey, Bob, hey, Jane, or whoever, hey, like, check out the store. What are you doing there? And you got to check that out. You got to get that looked at. And then they would say these words. They would go, we want you to go to the priest 
and get checked out. Because in that day, that's what you did. You had a disease, you had something, you went to the priest. And according to the law that's set out in Leviticus 13, it, that the priest would then make a decision on whether the disease you had was curable, curable or uncurable. Whether you could be made well or not made well. And, um, and so uh, if it was incurable though, you would be sent out outside of the city and you would have to um, live the rest of your life isolated from your friends and your family. And all of these 10 men were given the bad news. The priest inspected them. The priest looked at them. And then he said these words that you never wanted to hear the priest say to you. The priest said, unclean, unclean. You're unclean. And when they would hear that word unclean, they would drop to their knees. They would, they would be overwhelmed. They'd be incredibly filled with despair because they knew those words meant they weren't going home tonight to their family. They weren't going to be able to hug their wife or kiss their kids goodbye. They immediately would have to go outside the city walls into uh, a colony of other people who were suffering the same disease as they were. It meant that they would live the rest of their lives as outcasts, isolated, apart from family and friends. And from that point on, it would only get worse. Their hands and feet would go first. And then what would happen, they'd begin to shrivel. They'd begin to turn in on themselves and, and, uh, and ultimately would, would lose the use of them. They, they would even begin to, to rot and fall off. And, and it was an awful disease. And from this point on, those 10 men would not have to stay six feet away from people. They'd have to stay 20 feet away from people. And if people came their way and didn't notice them, they would have to uh, cover their face and their head and they'd have to yell, unclean, unclean, I'm unclean. And then people would social distance themselves. It was a life where you simply wanted, wanted and waited to die. But one day these 10 lepers are hanging around their colony, I guess, and they're talking and somehow the word had gotten to them. Somehow they'd heard the, of, this, of this guy who had been going around and healing people of their diseases and making blind people see and, and, and sick people well. And as they, as, they, as they heard about this, they realized and heard that this guy was going to be coming into Jerusalem and they realized he'd be coming across and close to, to their colony on his way to Jerusalem. And so they get all excited about this. They hear about this news and they figure, hey, what do we got to lose? Let's see if we can get this guy's attention because if he could heal us, we could be reunited with our family and our friends and be connected again. And, 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 and so they, they say, let's go for it. And so they decide to do it. And so they cover their heads and they, and they go to the edge of, of the city and they see this man, Jesus, coming. And they're just, they start yelling, Jesus, Jesus, hey, Jesus, over here. We're here. Hey, listen, can you heal us? Can you do something for us? We're, we, we need your help. We need you, Jesus, please, please help us. And that's where we pick up the story. I want to read a little bit of it to you. It's found in chapter Luke or in Luke chapter 17, verse 11. And it says, As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. And as he entered a village there, ten lepers stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. And they've got his attention. And they're calling out to him. And, 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 and look what happens. All of a sudden, Jesus stops. They're yelling. They're waving. They're trying to get his attention. Hey, over here, Jesus. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And, and this is what happens. In verse 14, he looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Now, there's a lot of questions in that story for me. I don't know if this is for you, but it's interesting that I would think, okay, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy. Jesus, we're here. Do something for us. Okay, go show yourselves to the priest. Okay, we're willing to do that. We're willing to do that, Jesus. But listen, um, maybe you should heal us first. Maybe you could make us better. Maybe you could put things back together for us. Because, you know, we may not have the smartest priest in the world, but I think he's going to see that, you know, the, 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 the oozing sores on our bodies. You know, I'm missing an ear and Bob's missing a nose. I think he's going to catch that. But, but, but so, Jesus, maybe he could heal us first. But they don't do that. They don't, they don't, they don't um, uh, argue with Jesus. They don't push back. I think they came together and they probably said, whatever Jesus says, we're going to do, okay, guys? Even if it doesn't make sense, what do we got to lose? Let's just do what this guy says. And Jesus looks at them, go to the priest 
And so they do. They don't argue. They turn and they go. And then something happens as they turn and they make their way towards the city to see the priest thinking, how are we even going to get in there? No one's even going to let us in there. But as they begin to go, something happens. And they're kind of hobbling along. And all of a sudden, the, the, their, their, their hands begin to move and, and they're not curled anymore. And they, they get feeling back in their legs. And, and all of a sudden, they're getting energy. And, and all they look at themselves. And, 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 and right before their very eyes, they're being healed. The leprosy is disappearing. And they're coming back to what they were at one point. And then as they're walking, they begin to, to jog a bit. And, and more and more is coming back together. And they're, they're getting healed as they go. And they're running towards the city. And they're all going for, let's get to the priest. Because they're thinking tonight, tonight I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sit with my family. I'm going to hug my kids. I'm going to have a meal with my friends. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to know the, the, the power and the, and the beauty of a touch again. I have it all to be hugged, to be touched by my wife or my, or my kids. It's going to be amazing. They, they know that things are about to go back to what they used to be, but they're going to be better. And they begin to run. And they're going. And they're moving. And they're going for it. Except one guy slows down as he notices and, he's, and he looks ahead and, and, and his friends, his nine friends are getting ahead of him. And he's looking and he stops. He stops. And he turns around and he looks back a couple hundred meters or whatever it may be at this point. He sees Jesus back there and he turns around and he makes his way back to Jesus. And he he comes before him and he kneels before him and, he, and he's just in awe. And look what he says. Look what happens in verse 15. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, shouting, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. This is amazing. And he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Interesting, the Samaritans, they weren't really like, they in fact were hated by the Jews. They're, they're like this, this, this half-breed. They, they, were, they were the people that, um, you know, uh, Jews didn't like because they intermarried with other cultures. And there was this racial underpinnings. And, and Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. See, in that moment, well, 10 people, 10 men were healed from a physical disease. Only one of them was truly healed completely, spiritually, emotionally, physically. See, the other nine still suffered from a disease that I call, and I think we all have it at times in our life, the sin of forgetfulness. The sin of forgetfulness. You see, most people see this story as a story of one thankful man and nine ungrateful men. But that's not the, this is not a story of ungratefulness. This is a, not a story of, of, of men who are ungrateful. Those men, let me tell you, I believe they were thankful. I guarantee they were thankful. They will be answering the what happened to you question the rest of their life. What happened to you? You're not going to believe what happened to me. You know, I got leprosy. We're throwing the call on you outside. We hear about this guy, Jesus. We, we got on the side streets. We waved him down. He, he told us to go to the priest. And as we did, we were, I mean, we were healed. It was amazing. And, I, and they're going to tell that story till the, till the day they die. They're thankful they're healed. See, the point of the story is not that these men were not thankful. It was that they forgot to demonstrate their thankfulness. See, Jesus wants us not to only be thankful, but what he wants us to do is put action to our gratitude. See, like these nine men, we are grateful for what happens to us, but forget to come and praise the one often who's responsible for what's happened to us. See, you can be married and be thankful for your spouse, but forget their, your anniversary or forget their birthday. Reminds my wife's birthday tomorrow. I can't forget that. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and you can be thankful for your job, but forget to do your best and simply you know, take it for granted. You just, your job, just be going, oh, yeah, my job, my job. And never be grateful for it. You can be thankful for God's grace and mercy, but never show that same grace and mercy to people around you. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you, folks, for your mercy towards me. I'm not showing it to them. And you can be thankful for something, but never actually act out your thankfulness. And you see, this is the difference between living 
and a knowledge of what God has done for you and living in the awareness of God's presence in your life. Being aware that he's with you and he's for you. See, when you only live with a knowledge of God, you know what you get? You get religion. You just get religion. That's all you get. But when you live in the awareness of God's presence in your life, you know what you get? When you say, God, I, wanna, I want to, you to live, live in your presence, you get relationship. Relationship with the God of the universe. And living in the awareness of God's presence is to live a life that consistently reminds you of what God has done for you. We need to constantly be coming back to that truth. And it's a life that actively praises God like that leper did who was healed. It's to live a life that is not controlled and led by the sin of forgetfulness. See, why do we sin? Why do we fall into temptation? I mean, God, I mean, most of us know, you know, we know what's right and wrong. We can kind of figure that out in our life. We know what God expects and teaches. We have a, we have a knowledge of God, but knowledge alone will result in you forgetting who God is. The enemy will put your mind on other things. He'll get you focused in different places. But when you're in a relationship with Jesus, you have to, you, have to, you know, with Jesus and with anybody, you have to face that person, don't you? You talk to them. You spend time with them. You grow in love for them. You work through things. You, you talk about it. You, 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 you know them. And Jesus knew that we would have a tendency to forget who he is in our life. He knew that we, like those nine men, could easily live our lives knowing what he did for us, but never taking the time to turn back again and go and kneel before him and shout, praise God. God, I praise you. I thank you. I'm so grateful for what you've done for me. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time, even in your own life, even in your own heart, you just maybe knelt before the Lord in the quietness of your devotional time or whatever it may be, or maybe driving your car and you're just overwhelmed. You go, God, I just want to thank you for what you've done in my life. God, I just want to thank you for who you are in my life. I want to thank you for dying on the cross, forgiving my sin, giving me hope. See, that's what, what Jesus does. And so today, Good Friday, we're reminded of that day when Jesus is about to go to the cross and he calls his disciples together for a meal. And it's at this moment that Jesus gives us only one of two things that he asks us to do in order not to be overcome by the sin of forgetfulness. And this, there's two things, only two things Jesus asked us. He said, be baptized and remember me through communion. Baptism is a powerful demonstration of what God's done in our life, Right? It's, it's going under that water, the old life that we were and coming up in the new life that he's given us. And we do that here. And I'm looking forward to the day we gather again and we can have another baptism. But he also tells us to remember him. And how are we to remember him? By coming together in communion, the Lord's Supper. And it serves to remind us of what Jesus did for us. It serves to keep us coming back to Jesus like that one leper did as he stopped and he turned around. See, communion is looking at our life and seeing how Jesus healed us and saved us and then bowing at his feet and thanking him and praising him for what he's done. It keeps that perspective. It keeps, it keeps that focus on the fact that Jesus died for you and me and he gives us hope. Now, I don't know about you, but communion is always a powerful act for me. It's, um, it accomplishes different things in my life. As I focus on remembering what Jesus did for me, he often does something in me. And, uh, and as I hold that bread and I take that cup, often I'll hear the promptings, the whispers of the Holy Spirit reminding maybe of a sin in my life and saying, Sean, what are you, what are you going there for? What are you, what are you doing that for? My, my love for you covers it all. You don't have to do that. Why don't, you, why don't you repent and respond to my grace and my love? Other times he'll encourage me and remind me that, that he's with me and he's for me. And because of his death and resurrection, he says, you know, anything's possible. Sean, I know you're going through some pretty big things right now, but listen, I'm able and I'll look at those symbols of bread and wine and I'll think, how amazing is God's love for us? Other times he'll inspire me. Sometimes he reminds me of heaven, that hope I have one day to be with him for all eternity. Sometimes he reminds me of friends and family and people who don't know him. And he'll encourage me to pray more boldly, to pray more intentionally for those situations and people. See, communion is a great place for you and I to take spiritual inventory. Take inventory in your life where you can examine the condition of your heart and invite Jesus to restore and free you from those sins that, that hold you down or keep you 
you know, in bondage and allowing him just to free you as you remember what he's done for you. See, the communion table is a place where you can pour out your heartbreaks to God, where, where you can worship him and fellowship with him, receive encouragement from him, be reminded of what he has done for you and who he is to you. And as you do all these things, you'll be remembering what Jesus has done. And it keeps your heart soft. And it keeps you open before God. See, communion is what God uses to move his truth from our head to our heart. You see, it's not enough to only hear the teaching of Jesus. The life of Jesus must somehow enter us, and that happens when we remember him through communion. Christ enters into our hearts through remembrance and through faith. Thank you, God, for reminding me of what you've done for me. In faith, I receive that. And we treat communion with reverence, but we also treat communion with joy. Why? Well, because it's for needy people like you and me. It's for all of us who have weaknesses and pain and trouble and fear in our lives. It connects with us to the one who knows our struggles and to, who whispers to us in moments just like this. this. This is my body. This is my body. Broken for you. It's what he does. It's what he whispers, what he reminds us about. And not only does communion remind us of what God has done, but it also reminds us that we're an extension of who he is. It's why in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes about you, the church, and he says, listen, we are called the body of Christ. We're called the body of Christ. Everything that we remember through the act of communion, we are to go and be to the world. And Jesus says, you're, you're the body, you're the church. You're my hands, don't forget that. You're my feet, you're my voice, you're my ears, you're my eyes. Don't forget those things. In moments like today, we are reminded not to forget that we are his body. Why? Because he gave his body when he died on a cross for us. And so as we remember what Jesus has done for us through communion all over this city and across our nation, even around the world, we know people are watching from all different places. I want you to Take that bread and that juice that you have in your homes right now. Hopefully you've taken the time. And to hold it with your family right now as I read from Scripture and lead you in communion. And here's what it says. And as you take that bread, a cracker, whatever you have. And, and it says in Mark chapter 14, and Jesus is with his disciples. And it says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. And then he broke it. He broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples saying, take it for this is my body. And there's nothing supernatural about this. There's nothing like magical about this stoned wheat cracker. But what it does, it reminds me, it's a symbolic. When I, I do this, I Lord, thank you for what you did when you died on the cross for my sin. And so as you hold that bread, just thank God for a moment and then partake together. Let's do that right now. gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them. They all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. The blood of Jesus is what cleanses us. The blood of Jesus is what gives us life. Blood is the lifeline in your body. And this is a demonstration again of what Jesus does for us spiritually practically as he breathes his life as he sheds his blood we receive the life that Jesus gave to us when he died on the cross so I want you to thank God I want you to thank God for a moment for the blood that he shed upon the cross Lord we're so grateful let's partake together Esther is going to sing a song these next few moments. And what I want you to do is a song of surrender. There's a question I want you just to ask the Lord in your homes right now as you pause and just reflect. And here's the question, Lord, where in my life have I been living with the sin of forgetfulness? What do you want to whisper to me this morning to help me remember your great sacrifice? So as Esther sings, take a moment, just pause, reflect, listen to the voice and the promptings of the Spirit in your life. When she's done, I'm going to come back and I'm going to pray a blessing over us. Let's sing this together.
to surrender ourselves afresh to you today and say, Jesus, have your way in our life. And God, would you remind us to live a life that remembers what you've done for us? And God, as we surrender our hearts, we say, God, have your way in our hearts. Lord, that we would not live with the sin of forgetfulness and forgive us, God, when we've taken for granted all that you've done for us. And that we would invite you, Jesus, to begin to bring an awareness of your presence in our hearts and our lives day in and day out in moments like now when times are tough and things feel overwhelming. Lord, what a great opportunity to invite your Holy Spirit to fill us and to continue to remind us that you're with us, that you're for us, that you are in us. And God, we love you today and we bless you and we exalt you as our Savior and our King. And we say, God, thank you for dying on the cross for our sin. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you're doing around us, amongst us, and in us. And so would you bless your people today, Father? Would you fill them with your peace? Would you fill them with your comfort? Would you instill with them the hope that we have in you? And Lord, we're so grateful for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for reminding us. Thank you for this moment that we can remember what you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Church, we're really excited about Sunday. Resurrection Sunday is coming. But let me just tell you a couple of things this week that we're going to be doing as well. We have a food drive. We want to partner with the school district and Bowls of Hope and Salvation Army and the Starfish Backpack Program that, that feed over 1,000 kids throughout the school year when school's in. And, and so they want to um, continue to feed those kids. And so we say we'll come along and partner with them. And so we have some opportunities for you to uh, join us to, to drop off some food or you can give online and just try the drop down menu is food drive or an e-transfer, put food drive. And would you just uh, um, bless. But we'd love for you to actually go get the, go get the stuff we're asking for, some peanut butter and tins of meat and tins of pasta. You'll see it on the screen right now. And, uh, and bring it out from 9 to 4 on Tuesday in the back parking lot of the church. We have a trailer there. We want to fill it up. And we'd love just to see you. The staff will be there. We're going to have some social distancing protocol. Don't worry. But we'd love you to come and just drive in, drop it off. Let us pray, encourage you, say hi. And, uh, and let's fill that trailer and, and, and help feed those kids uh, in the coming weeks. We're excited about that. Easter Sunday. Invite a friend on, on Easter Sunday. We have, uh, I'm going to be talking about why the resurrection is so important to us. What's the deal with the resurrection? And did it really happen? And so what a great time to invite people uh, to church this Sunday online uh, with you. Do a watch party, whatever you need to do and encourage that. Um, and then we're going to sing a song right now. We're going to sing a closing song of just declaring the, the King of Kings that we serve. And as the band leads us in that, why don't you worship for a few moments and stick around just for a couple minutes afterwards. There's a few more announcements that we want to let you know about. And, um, and live with gratitude and live with hope. Today may be Friday, but church, Sunday's coming. God bless you. Let's sing this together.
Thanks again for joining us today. If there's any way we can encourage you or pray for you, please contact us at prayer at mainstreetchurch.ca. And to find out the various ways that you can give online, please visit our website at mainstreetchurch.ca and click on give. Our heart is to encourage you in your relationship with Jesus, and we're here to help you take that next step in knowing Him. If you have any questions or feedback or want more information about Main Street Church, visit our website. And thanks again for joining us today. Have a great Sunday, and God bless you.